Hello, Richard. It's lovely to see you. Hello. Oh, Richard, this is Sasha. Do you, do, have you met Sasha before? No. no. I'm really interested in Sasha. I mean, I've had enough of you, to be honest, over the years. <laughs> no, I knew this would be the this is, this is huge for me, the Sasha thing. <laughs> <laughs> We were, we were hoping you'd be in Suffolk so I could stop and land on my flight around and, and talk to you about one of the projects I thought was going to be the most exciting actually on our expedition, but actually you're, you're in the US. So I'm in the US, yeah. thank you so much. I mean, you two know each other and you don't know me from a bar of soap, but I, um, I was really, really keen. As you know, I've heard you on podcasts various times talking about well, the sustainable development goals, but also make my money matter. And uh, I thought it was, a, it was a really important thing to include in our expedition. I'm trying to fly around the country in an electric powered paramotor as part of a, an initiative for the, as part of the, the lead up to the climate COP this year. Sasha said so cleverly and, and sort of inveigled me into being here because you'd rather talk to her alone. <laughs> Can we talk to Richard about, about pensions? I'll just talk away. I mean, I think... Uh... The kind of big context of this is, I think, that as a person who's, you know, as it were, focused on people all these years doing comic relief, you know, poverty, life saving, all the other issues that we're passionate about, I definitely thought, great, I can not do climate. Um, and uh, in 2005, when we did Make Poverty History, if you remember that, the white ban campaign. I remember a very dramatic moment when the climate person stormed out of one of our key meetings because we thought the messaging was too complex, you know, to include climate in it as well. And I think, you know, one of the great epic and necessary changes in the last 15 years is that people have perceived, both the climate people have communicated that it's about people, and the people, people have realized that all the issues they care about are becoming increasingly connected with climate. So that if you're worried about poverty, if you're worried about women's rights, if you're worried about migration, they're all going to be massively negatively affected and already are being by, you know, by issues of climate. So I'm sort of very interested about, you know, the place of climate in the campaigning uh, stratosphere because I now can't see the difference between them you know it's people and planet all the way and that's one of the reasons I so passionate about the, the SDGs because they actually you know the the MDGs had nothing to do with climate the SDGs it's completely integrated so um SDG. you know but Richard, but I always STG what is that? oh sorry the sustainable development goals which are the kind of new to-do list for the world that the UN launched in 2015, um, <clears throat> which actually, you know, they're, they're, there are too many of them and they're very hard. You know, the world, we would be living in a utopia if they were fulfilled. But the most interesting thing about them to me at the moment is how much business has used them, you know, because businesses are much better organized than government. And in some ways, you know, within their own context, more powerful. A huge number of businesses now say we've got to stick to the SDGs and they go through them like a checklist and say, how are we doing on diversity? How are we doing on climate? How are we doing on supply chains? How are we doing on disability? What effect are we having on our workers? All of these things. So you've been I think, involved in that, haven't you, in, in making them easy to communicate? That's what I've tried to do. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm, it's quite weird now because the people I hate most in my life are the people who make trailers and posters for my movies. And yet that's sort of the job I'm doing for the SDGs. I'm trying to make them, you know, so we developed 17 really simple graphics in nice colors with short names and a little wheel that is a sort of logo, logo for them and everything like that. I keep trying to make really, really juicy short trailers to say, let's pay attention to this. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, I've become, you know, increasingly um, you know, concerned, you know, nice and late about climate. Someone said something very clever to me the other day, said that weather used to be the last thing on the news, and now it's the first thing on the news, and it's not good news, as it were, you know, and that's one of the, I think, huge shifts in the last five years as well, that everything people said would happen is happening, um, you know, and, and it has predicted quite often. 
Uh, and and you know, it also used to be particularly the thing that used to you know worry me was you get a flood in Wales and some houses get done and they have to replace the carpets. You get a flood in Bangladesh and two hundred and fifty thousand people die. So that kind of inequity of the effects of climate, but. I think, you know, as the fires in Australia or in California and the hurricanes in New Orleans prove, it's going to hit everyone and, um, you know, destroy, be you rich or poor, um, in case you're rich and you don't care about the poor. Um, so, I mean, my journey to what I would consider, you know, my biggest climate thing was I watched this brilliant TED talk by a woman called Bronwyn King, who's a cancer doctor. And she had a meeting with her financial advisor when she was like 33, asked him, where's my pension invested? He said, you know, showed her the list and three out of her top six investments were in cigarette companies. So she said, look, I'm killing more people in my life than I'm saving. I'm actually a pro-cancer investor even though I'm dedicating every moment of my life to curing it. So uh, I got very interested in this idea of, of money and the huge amounts of money that are invested, both our money and everyone. So, you know, when we did make poverty history, I think we probably added 30 billion to the pot in terms of debt cancellation and extra aid. There is 47 trillion in pensions. That's the amount of money that's being invested in your choice of businesses and initiatives. And um, all the time you're saying, how are we going to change the world? Where, how do you turn the billions into trillions? Investments is one of those huge areas. And, you know, your, your most basic choice is in, who gives a fuck investment and mm -hmm. sustainable an ethical investment. And when I started looking into it, I thought this is going to be one of the, I won't be able to do it because it's going to be sort of value versus values and money versus morals. And you're going to have to take a hit. But actually in the last five years, that's all changed and sustainable investments are doing as well, if not better, because the marketplace is changing. And I changed my pension last year and apparently its value has gone up 41% in the last in the last year, which I mean, no one understands, but is surreal. So I'm very interested. I'm, I'm quite interested in the negative side. I'm interested in not investing in deforestation, not investing in arms, not investing in fossil fuels and all those things. But I'm super interested in the positive side, which is just to suddenly realize you can invest in wind farms, you can invest in the people who stick oil in wind farms, you can invest in people who are giving sustainable food to local schools, um, you can invest in affordable health care, you can invest, and then you can invest also in, you know, coffee farms in, in Kenya and everything like that. So if people started to understand that while they're doing all the important things you can do in your life in terms of flying and purchase and all of you know what you buy how you travel what energy you use you've got this massive tool which is your money both in banks in insurance and particularly because i'm focusing on that first in pensions which could be pouring money resources and you get equal rewards um, uh, from doing the right thing so it's a it's a genuine win-win situation and probably where the most money that's going to come that's going to do the most good in climate arguments um will you know will come from and do you have any idea of the figures behind how much of ordinary people's investment is supporting things that are yeah anti-climate change I mean, anti-climate change and anti-other things, as it were, I literally can't see why anyone would invest in cigarettes because that's just going to, you know, kill other people. Um, no, but what I would say is it's, you know, yeah. uh, and I should know that answer, but the truth is it is a dangerously high proportion. 
Yeah. Um, you know, you will find that if you've got a top 20, there will be fossil fuel companies. Uh, there will be companies that thrive on deforestation. You know, they're, they're a good, those are in some cases the biggest, most traditional, most last century, most therefore in a way trusted, you know, car manufacturers and all those kind of things. So there's no way that you're not going to be doing a lot that is not pro climate and how brilliant if all your choice could be in the direction of, you know, electric cars and against plastics. Richard, if people watching this will want to know what they can do about it. Now, most of us, the reason we put our money in with money people is that we, we're not smart enough to do it ourselves. So we want to know the smart questions to ask the people who invest our money, rather than just saying, can we just do more green investments? For instance, palm oil. Now, palm oil is in itself not a bad thing, but palm oil, which is built on what you, with the remnants of what used to be great majestic forests and all that logging is gone and nothing is being replanted and all the trees and the rivers are things and the fish are poisoned and there's, everything is catastrophe. When palm oil grows on degraded ground, it can grow beside motorways, it can grow, it can grow anywhere. It doesn't need prime soil. So palm oil in itself is good. Palm oil grown on knockdown forests is bad. How, what questions can people ask their money people who say, well, we've got, we've got a nice little tranche of something which I suggest you invest in. I mean, how make us smart. Give us some smart. And you know, the great thing, Joanne, is you probably don't have to do that work, is, is the truth of the matter. Um, I mean, the great joy about this campaign is the pension companies are moving in the right direction. Um, and, you know, this year we've shifted 400 billion, even in the UK, into ethical and sustainable things. So on the whole, the question a normal person would ask, if you've got a financial advisor, great, say to them, you know, can I please be in a ethical and sustainable pension? But most people do it through work and they, you've got financial officers there and they'll say it's complicated, but it is a change that they can make. And, um, and most of the uh, pension companies now who are committing themselves to you know, being in a net zero position by 2050 and halfway there by 2030. They're offering products, as it were, which make and, you know, keep to that promise. And there may be various shades of it, but a normal person should go to when you, you know, it's compulsory to have a pension when you're young and young people are clever and they're activists and they should just say, well, no, I want my pension, my default pension, the one I start with, to be an ethical one. Now, the whole, I remember first talking to Mark Carney about this, and he said, if you go into it in too much detail, if you wait for the evaluation systems to become 100% reliable, it'll be 2050. They're all trying to sort it out as quickly as they can. They're endlessly double checking, making sure there isn't greenwashing, trying to understand how the balance is continuing to make profit and all that. But there's just a very clear line drawn between the three things, one of which is no holds barred, so you're investing in everything. Do no harm, which means that you're divesting in the things that you nominate. And do good, which is where you say, I specifically want courageous, good, exciting investment in sustainable things. But in a way, that's all you need to know. You know, for a normal person, they would just go into legal in general or Scottish windows or w widows or nest or something like that and say, I want the pension that I'm part of to be one of your good sustainable ones. Uh, and then, you know, if you want to be interested, you can find out more. I found out the other day I was investing in green cement. Cement's apparently a huge ecological mm -hmm. issue. And in reverse vending machines, which is a thing that they've got in Germany where you put in a plastic bottle and you get a token out that makes you, that lets you spend more in Tesco's as it were. Um, so if you want to get interested, you can. And increasingly and very quickly, there's going to be available things online where you say, well, I've got this pension. You type in the name of your pension and it'll tell you where all your money's going. But for a normal person who wants to make the change, go to your employee or get five people in your company to go to the employee and say, come on, you're doing, you're doing all these things that you know, with supply chains, that getting rid of plastic, all of these things that are 
big and important, but they're not as big as where your massive pension money is being invested so it can support a hundred other companies to do the right thing. So my friends who've changed have found it relatively simple and everybody is now aware that that's the choice. There will not be a person, there will not be a chief financial officer who won't say, oh, I know what you're talking about and won't say, which they might have done, you're some kind of weird um, ecological warrior who is asking me to do something I don't want to do because everybody is seeing this as a big old opportunity to do the right thing without doing too much work on it. And you also mentioned insurance, not just pensions. Well, yeah, I changed my bank to a bank called Triados, for instance, who've been, you know, who, oh, I mean, I don't know, I realized my bank money was invested. I thought it just sat there and grew if someone watered it. But banks are massive investors. And I think banks are next on the list. And you are getting banks that are setting up that are only eco banks and make this promise like Triados does. Insurance, I'm most smoky about, but once again, all the money that you put in insurance, that's what it does. They all invest it. There's masses of money there. So the insurance companies, again, you might want to make a choice where you go to an insurance company that says what we're doing with your money while it's waiting for you to have a car crash is investing in things that are going to help planet people and animals. And your campaign is called Make My Money Matter. How do people engage with that? How does that help them to green their investments? Well, you would go to the Make My Money Matter um, website and you'll be asked to do two things. One of which you'll do is, as it were, join petitions and try and create as much pressure because there was not much pressure on mm -hmm. government or um, you know, on the pension firms. But the other thing is it'll just explain to you what you should do as it were, who you talk to, how you talk to them about it, the three simple questions that you ask. And with any luck, you know, millions of people will say, I'm not the slightest bit interested in investing in all the things I hate. Um, this is a real opportunity to become, you know, because I made four phone calls and argued a bit, I can then sit on my pension and it won't be inherited in the world on fire. I mean, so all of these areas are important and, you know, also, if you're a shareholder, you've got to check where your shares are and you can become an activist shareholder. And a lot of the pensions are activist shareholders, by the way, in companies and are trying to change their behavior. Richard, is this, you're in California, but is this, um, but you're English, is, is this something that's totally international, make my money matter? Or is it, is it, is it just a, a kind of a British, is it just your baby brainchild? No, no, no. I mean, look, I got a bee in my bonnet. There have been, and look, there are great people. There's a great organization called Share Action that's been working on this, you know, for years. Um, and we just, you know, as usual, when I start, Joanna, as you remember, there's only two of me. Um, so as it were, we couldn't say we're going to change the financial organization of the country. Um, so what we thought was we'll start in the UK and we'll start with pensions. But every day we find new friends um, and so it is growing it's actually particularly strong in australia there's there's a company there's a really successful company called my future super because in australia you call them superannuations don't you rather than pensions so it is a growing movement and we're trying to find our partners and so in the uk we are talking to the uk government to make this one of the things they talk about at COP to all the other countries to slightly change the laws. Because, you know, trustees of pension funds and companies, they used to, it used to be their moral, immoral duty to only focus on profits. Mm -hmm. Whereas what a company's money is doing is part of that company's account sheet. So I'm hoping that it's something that's gonna, so make my money matter, the name might stay pretty strictly UK, but the movement is increasing everywhere in the world as people realize that invest. I sat next to someone the other day who said they were in control personally of $7 billion of investment money, um, you know, which makes Comic Relief look like a horrible underachievement for all the work we put into it. Um, and, and, you know, it, 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 what's been so great is seeing the tide changing. So I saw the, I can't remember who it was, but someone I was deeply frightened of at some big business meeting saying that 
Um, sustainability was the greatest investment opportunity since the Industrial Revolution. It was going to be the biggest change in how capitalism worked and what the functions of companies are. And on the whole, you know, often you've got to do the thing you do best and finance people know best about money and investment. And the more of them that realize that they're the kind of necessary superheroes of the hour, the more the responsibility for climate, just like governments realize it and individuals, wonderful individuals are increasingly realizing it. So what we're trying to do every day is drive the people who run finance to realize, fuck, it's me. It's not someone else. I can't stand aside from this debate. Yeah. I've got the power to help all the people who are doing the right thing. So from your point of view, working in this area now for some time, um, how optimistic do you feel? Our slogan for this expedition was, for example, Britain drove the Industrial Revolution. Could we drive the Green Revolution too? Are you optimistic that from a pensions perspective, rapid change can be brought about? Very, actually. That's why I mentioned that, you know, 400 billion have changed. The total pension pot is 3.1 trillion just in the UK. So obviously there's a long way to go. But the great thing is people are seeing it also, you know, they're seeing it as a moral responsibility where they have power. They're also seeing it as a commercial opportunity. Why, as a pension company, would you not offer a new generation the option of making their money work to save the planet? So, I, I mean, I'm very surprised how well we've done so far. You're always frustrated when anyone says no, but we've got, I think, 70 companies who joined our green pension charter, and that includes Tesco's and it includes IKEA, you know, great big famous companies. So I, I'm surprised how well it's done. But Richard, yeah. this is exciting. This yeah, is I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled by it. It could be weirdly, but financially speaking, and in terms of lives, um, you know, the biggest thing I've ever been involved in. And I just hearing you speak about it in podcasts was one of the things that I also found instantly reassuring. You know, since the since the bushfires, there have been things where I've thought, times where I thought, oh my God, can we really make any change big enough? And hearing you speak about just pensions and the amount of money and the amount of change that you could bring about was a moment that gave me real hope. So um, yeah, really, really excited to have had a chance to talk to you directly about it. And if we can share that with a lot more people, I think, yeah. Yeah, and it's something you, it's something you, what, what I love about, I kind of see a shift in my career to thinking, you know, 1985, I thought it was about charity, give to Comic Relief, Oxfam, Save the Job. 2005, make poverty history, get the bastards in charge to actually behave with some morality. But I find my kids are now saying, what can I actually do in my own life? I'm not willing to wait for voting and just for successful charity projects. And I see them changing so many of their behaviors, leading to a genuine consumer revolution. And this is part of, of that, what you can actually do. Someone, anyone who hears this tomorrow can ask this question. And even if it's a bit of work and even if it's a bit of a fight, um, I think we've worked out that changing your pension and you shouldn't not do any of these other things, but it's 21 times more effective than stopping flying change it to a renewable energy supplier and giving up eating meat. Um, and it's a lot easier than those three things. Wow, that is something, isn't it? Yes. 20, 21 times more. More effective. All those yes. things together. Yeah. Um, is it easy to change your bank? I mean, is that that's kind of, I suppose it is, but how would you know which is a green bank? You said triadox. Well, yeah, and I don't know the other ones. That's the one that I knew about, and my new credit card's got a leaf on it. So they definitely are interested in the environment. But um, but I think even within banks, you can say, I want my money to be invested in a certain area yeah. rather than others. But mm -hmm. I mean, what I would do on the banking front is I'd just move a bit of your money and have a second credit card if you can. Yeah. Uh, I don't think all my money's shifted because you find your money's locked into all sorts of systems where the more you say, you know, and you're locked into various accounts and everything. But open another account, look into it, find a great bank, and then slowly, slowly shift. 
And you, are, you mentioned asking questions. Is the easiest way to ask questions to try and get on the phone, to try and write letters? I know I've tried to get on the phone and ask actually Nest for information. I found it very hard to actually get anybody who, who would speak to me or give me any real information. Yeah, look, I think that can be frustrating. And if you're in a company, ask someone else to do it. Ask, you know, the, the CFO or whoever it is or whoever's doing your fantasy. I mean, I'm sorry you had a tough time with Nest because actually they're a very good company. You might have got an unlucky person. And also they will have automatic systems that sort of bat you back. But it's, as I say, if you're not going to eat, if it's much more effective than not eating any more meat again, it is worth a bit of a fight. And you will eventually, one of the great things is the people who are in charge of sustainability in these companies really have got the bit between their teeth. So if you get in touch with the right person, if you get unlucky, keep trying. If you get lucky, it'll be fast. And I saw a really interesting chart the other day that was showing that actually, whilst some change has felt really slow coming from now, change is quite often exponential. So whilst we're kind of starting to reach um, tipping points in terms of climate, there's also change is starting to move and could start shoot straight upwards now that they're starting to gather momentum. So yeah, I think we both kind of your story of what you do with your money and Allardale here with showing what can happen on scale and just what is it 18, 12, 18 years mm -hmm. um, are both really inspirational and big picture. Yeah, I'm, I mean, and it, it couldn't be, you know, it's our great, you know, it's our great generational challenge. I love the UN title of that document. They said, you know, code red for humanity. Mm. And all of us have got that 5% of our time to say, let's make sure that our kids don't, you know, burn to a cinder. That was the kettle or something saying it's ready. <laughs> so we've got, we've got to leave you. <laughs> we've got to leave you. Okay. Look, thank you. So if ever I can be helpful with anything, do say. And if you want, you know, if you're ever looking into this and want someone who really knows what they're talking about, I know those people too. So it's really lovely to see you. Joanna, you're a saint, as you always have been. Love you. Ash, it's lovely to meet you. Good luck. Be careful. Thank you very much, Richard. Okay. Bye-bye. Awesome. Bye. Bye-bye.